Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to today's webinar on a freight and shipping market update. I'm Brian O'Leary, Executive Director of the Book Industry Study Group. If you're joining today's session, you probably already know that the COVID-19 pandemic has caused massive disruptions in international shipping and domestic freight. Early on, capacity cuts at some ports of origin led to backups and shipments, but soon after, soaring consumer demand has led to crowded shipping lanes, uh, increased travel times, and a number of other uh, significant impacts on the freight and shipping market. Arriving international shipments have also competed with domestic shipments for increasingly scarce trucking capacity. In this session, we're going to host a conversation about the current state of freight and shipping, as well as what to expect in the near future. Um, to start, uh, I'd like to ask uh, each of our panelists to introduce themselves and their affiliations, starting with David Hetherington. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is David Hetherington, and I am Vice President of Global Business Development for Books International. We are a third-party dis distribution provider uh, based in Dulles, Virginia. We have uh, manufacturing operations in Dulles, uh, as well as uh, distribution and manufacturing operations in the United Kingdom under the banner of United Independent Distributors. Some of the, the, uh, the company names under the uh, UK operation are Marston, Orca, Turpin, and Eurospan. And thank you for the opportunity to speak with you this afternoon. Thank you, David. Uh, and now, uh, Susie Scali from Meadows Y. I am Director of International Sales for Meadows Y. And I think a lot of the publishing community are familiar with us. We specialize in international logistics for the print and publishing industry with offices in North America, China, Singapore, continental Europe, and the UK. And we work not specific to the US market only, but we handle all global markets. Uh, in addition, we're one of the oldest US customs brokers in the United States. So we uh, give advice to the publishing industry pre-production on what impact that product could have tariff wise. Um, so we're, we're a full service freight forwarder. Great, thank you. It's important to have your perspective here with us today. And finally, uh, Ryan Forbes uh, from ReaderLink, if you could introduce yourself. Thank you, Brian. My name is Ryan Forbes. I'm the Vice President of Logistics and Transportation for ReaderLink Distribution Services. Uh, we are a domestic and international distributor uh, of books. Um, obviously, the publishing community knows us very well. Um, I'm somewhat new to the book industry, but obviously not new to freight. Um, but, but the concepts and the challenges are the same across several industries, uh, and I'm glad to be here uh, speaking today. Thank you. Well, and certainly in, in, at a moment like this, having a lot of experience in the topic is critically important, uh, and more important than even in, than having a book background. Um, David, if I could start with you, um, you've prepared some slides to kind of give us an overview of the current state of freight and shipping in the book industry and perhaps how it compares with what you've seen in, in prior years. Do you want to kick us off with that? Sure. Okay, so I mean, I think that it's, it's fair to say that COVID-19 has exposed uh, risks and opportunities in, uh, in our operating models and the supply chain. I, I think that, uh, you know, examining uh, my experience over a long career, I, I think I can safely say that I do not recall a time when the supply chain was on facing more challenges than it does right now. Much of this afternoon's discussion will focus on international activity, but as Brian correctly pointed out, this is not just an international issue, this is a domestic issue as well. And this is an issue that is likely to be exacerbated as the uh, uh, trajectory in the growth of e-commerce uh, continues you know, across the, the scope uh, of, uh, of, the, of the US uh, economics. Uh, and as publishers, uh, decide that they want to develop their own B2C capabilities, which is something uh, you should be uh, very aware of. And while the challenges are significant, many are surmountable, but they require changes to the traditional uh, supply chain strategies that have been with us for, for decades, right? We need to learn from the pandemic and we need to build more responsive business models, but we need to do so with what I'm uh, describing as pandemic speed, right? 
and few organizations are going to be spared the challenges. Uh, the big organizations will perhaps be better uh, able to weather them, but the small organizations need to be able to respond as well. And the one thing that I would urge everyone to do is to avoid what, to borrow a phrase from Alan Greenspan, irrational exuberance. I think that um, the, the, uh, the magnificent sales that some publishers have been reporting are uh, likely to change dramatically as people have other ways to spend their money. And I think that uh, we are in for an era of bell type. Next slide, please. So let's compare international freight and domestic freight. And so certainly Susie and Ryan will be speaking more about both of you. But I think it's fair to say that there are cost and capacity issues on both the international side and the domestic side. On the international side, you have a problem with the, the uh, availability of container ships, the availability of containers, the fact that uh, perhaps it uh, may come as news to some of us that there are resurgences of COVID in key Chinese ports that are involving uh, delays. There, of course, is that, that remarkable episode uh, in the Suez Canal. So we have port congestion, we have the Suez backup, we have COVID coming back, and then, of course, we have Brexit. We, both sides of the equation, whether it's international or the domestic market, we have an aging workforce. Uh, in the UK, I've heard, I heard a remarkable statistic the other day that there are openings for some 60,000 drivers uh, for, for trucks and that 30,000 qualification tests were postponed by the uh, licensing agencies in the United Kingdom because of uh, COVID restrictions. And in my view, and I would certainly welcome uh, feedback from Susie and Ryan, I don't believe that there's any near-term relief in price or capacity to come. And I think, again, I'm going to say here, I believe that there are limited opportunities to negotiate around freight capacity and cost issues. Right now, you need to get your product delivered. Now is not a time to, uh, to uh, pick a fight, if you will, with your carrier. Next slide, please. So let's add to that what's going on in other parts of the supply chain. And I would urge everyone on this call to take a holistic view of the supply chain. This is not just one isolated issue of freight, whether it's domestic or international, it is the entire supply chain that has to be considered. You need to be evaluating whether you should be moving work onshore and uh, from offshore uh, for a variety of reasons, obviously uh, uh, time and cost being one element, but the COVID routes, right? Certain work can only be done in China, but if there's a COVID resurgence, whether you're going to get that work or not remains to be seen. Domestic manufacturing capability. There is, it is a tight market for, for manufacturing with recent acquisitions taking place. I think that we, what we will see is that uh, the capacity for the manufacturing industry will be rationalized. You need to consider offset versus digital economics. I think that they both have different profiles. Both of them are appropriate for specific situations, offset obviously being longer run, digital being having more value with short run activities. We'll talk a little bit about that in a few minutes. The shift, uh, the paper supply, uh, supply and paper price. Unquestionably, paper is going up. Uh, some of us uh, have experienced the cost of, of wood uh, tripling in the past year. So it's no surprise that paper goes up with it. The shift from bricks and mortars to B to C. And to, and to me, I think that this is a point that cannot be emphasized too strongly. Uh, the book industry is moving at lightning pace from, uh, from the traditional bricks and mortar to B to C business. And we all need to be uh, evaluating how our organizations are capable of handling that shift from, B, from bricks and mortar to B to C, because obviously it puts a lot more strain on uh, freight and transportation issues. Sustainability, right? Another important consideration. While all this is going on, there's a, a large movement for sustainable supply chain. And we'll be talking about that more in the coming months with the book industry study. Brexit, right? the horror stories about uh, UK publishers trying to get product into uh, the continent uh, with the new regulations, with the uh, lack of shipping capacity. Uh, with the increased tolls uh, and uh, tariffs uh, are uh, widespread. And again, another issue here, call, perhaps calls for another issue, uh, another 
uh, evaluation of where you're producing your books, right? Enrollment declines in the United States, uh, open access, inclusive access, a, a change in the higher education market space, the ascendance of digital, and of course, what is the cost of being out of stock, right? Uh, I've been a, uh, a zealot for tight inventories uh, for, for decades, but I think that we are now at a point where we need to be paying more attention to how much inventory we have. And I think uh, considering uh, to have a little bit of just-in-case inventory may not be a bad idea. Next slide. Okay, so what have we learned? We've learned in the past uh, 18 months that managing cash and fixed costs are of paramount importance, especially when we have an environment with a high degree of uncertainty. Secondly, we've learned that uh, organizations need to aggressively be reducing their fixed costs and shift from uh, to volume-driven variable costs from a fixed cost basis. And what are the strategies that you can help to do this? Well, one is to perhaps outsource your warehousing while you retain your order to cash capabilities and you uh, hold on to those important customer relationships. Second point would be to regularly uh, revisit your manufacturing and inventory strategies. This is not something uh, to say that we've always done it this way. I think you need to constantly be looking at it. And I think in another important consideration is evaluate whether you might not be better off to ship directly from your manufacturer to your customer whenever possible. The fewer handoffs in the supply chain, the better off you'll be. Okay, next. What else would I suggest? You need to study your end-to-end -end supply chain. This is no time for silo thinking. You have to, to look at the, the, the supply chain from the origination of the project to the delivery to the customer, from the first printing to the reprint. You need to look at all of those pieces, not only to examine where you can make improvements, but examine where you have a potential vulnerability. You wanna focus on availability and lowering the cost of ownership. Having, uh, having uh, a, a book that costs you 10 cents less by taking uh, an alternative route doesn't do you any good if it's not there when the customer wants it. Third point is that I would be suggesting that you want to spend more time evaluating digital manufacturing uh, uh, in place of offset to support situational inventory. Digital typically supports three inventory models. Uh, offset does not. One is print on demand. The second is automated stock replenishment where the publisher sets a limited uh, a limit on the number of units that they want in inventory. And when the uh, inventory level falls below that limit, you go back to press automatically. And the third is the traditional core method where you're going to be building inventory in anticipation of sale, the traditional uh, print first, sell later, right? Next point would be, I would consider any opportunity you have to print and fulfill from the same location. The number of handoffs, you wanna reduce the number of handoffs in your supply chain. And while it may be a bit more expensive, the faster you get it to your customer, the better. This is gonna be extremely critical as publishers build B to C capabilities. I think that you will see aggressive uh, attempts to build this capability within the industry and uh, competition for limited freight resources as uh, traditional big box retailers uh, uh, focus on B to C. I read it in an amazing article this morning about uh, Walmart's plans for uh, fiscal uh, 2022. They have committed to invest $16 billion, $16 billion, which is almost as much as the, the sales of the book publishing industry in the United States in e-commerce, in technology, and in supply chain improvement, right? This is absolutely going to put more pressure on uh, those of us in the book industry. Next one. Okay, thank you, Brian. So move quickly. These issues demand your attention. This is not something to approach from a leisurely basis. I think you really need to look at this quickly and carefully and comprehensively. You want to set a, sec a sector-specific strategy. Uh, if you're in education, I think you have one strategy. If you're in trade, you have another strategy. If you're a coffee table book publisher strategy or a book with uh, unique devices with it, you have a, a third strategy to consider. Your strategy should be specific to the books you produce and the markets that you support. Basic third point here, the, the longer your supply chain, the higher the risk. 
shortening uh, the supply chain reduces your safety stock requirements uh, where possible and offers better customer services. And I would urge you to do two things, expand your supply chain knowledge, the end-to-end -end supply chain, not just your specific uh, functional specialty, and to be an active participant in industry organizations like BISG. We spend a lot of time looking at the supply chain and I will be the first to admit that uh, it's not the most glamorous part of the business, right? We don't get a lot of coverage in, uh, in Publishers Weekly, but right now the supply chain is more important than it's ever been. And if you have any questions, there's some contact information which Brian will share later on. Thank you. And Thanks, I apologize David. if I went too fast. The um, maybe I could just leave this slide up for a moment and ask Susie and Ryan, uh, from your perspective, does this resonate with you? Is this the industry that you also see, or are there some differences from your perspective? I would say, Dave, hit the nail right on the head here with understanding uh, the supply chain holistically um, and understanding, you know, the end to end, um, you know, value add and, and how that's impacting, you know, our industry. In general, and making sure that you know we're not just thinking um, within our own functional areas or silos, and and you know making sure that we collaborate and share with our commercial teams and sales folks, um, you know what it takes uh, to, to deliver those end products in order to you know help them manage expectations. And Susie, David talked about uh, cost and capacity or cap or, or availability of capacity uh, as being significantly constrained now and in the future. Is that something that Meadows Wise also sees in, in this environment? Yes, but way beyond that, David really did hit the nail on the head because we're, what we see and our concerns are related to um, potential returns, for example. You've got, I think what David said, you print to sell. And that's with a business we handle, which is a cross section of all of the types of publishing David just described. Um, and specifically the trade side. Um, here we're approaching $20,000 a 40 foot container coming from China to North America. Um, that's that's a big number and if you're printing projecting on sales you're going to sell that at those numbers it's a, it's a little scary i think it's i think david's point about you know really intellectualizing what you're doing it's an excellent point that's the message we're trying to send to our clients as we're booking containers at you know potentially $200,000 a clip and prepaying at booking to secure space. So it sounds like that there are a number of uh, entangled issues here. Maybe we could start with freight and, and talk about that for a moment. Um, maybe start with Ryan. What is ReaderLink seeing and, and how is it affecting with respect to freight and how is it affecting your ability to serve your customers? So obviously we have and everybody knows we have a whole year of pent up demand working its way through the US supply chain um, in extreme competition for freight resources, specifically over the road qualified drivers to move truckload freight to distribution centers. Uh, there's significant competition uh, to move less than truckload freight with LTL networks at or exceeding capacity. Uh, where carriers are literally turning down business. And it's not a matter of opening up the checkbook and saying, you know, we'll pay you more. Uh, carriers uh, just cannot source um, available, you know, 53 foot drop trailers, for our example, to, to, to give you your traditional five to six trailers that you need at origin. Um, you know, carriers go out and uh, they're trying to recruit drivers, then and they're find out, finding out that they can only you know, attain 10 to 15% of those uh, recruitment goals. Um, we see quite a bit of over the, low, over the road truck load rejections. Um, and, and obviously, you know, looking at the, the indexes, we are seeing uh, spot rates anywhere from, you know, 40 to sometimes, you know, 85% or more higher 
than uh, previous year as uh, you know, North American van freight activity is up 40%. Um, and we're competing against all other ambient shipments, shippers out there uh, for capacity in order to move our freight. Um, so it's, it's, it's a very tight, challenging market at this time. David, how about from your perspective, um, what do you see that uh, with respect to freight? Well, I, I can't think of any customer that uh, we deal with who doesn't have a concern about it. You know, and I think that um, the, uh, uh, it, it, it is perhaps maybe the single most important factor in the balance of 21, 2021 between success and failure. And I think what, what's, what's really important, though, is to understand what your organization now defines as freight and what they're likely to define it as in the future. Uh, I cannot emphasize too strongly how many publishers are migrating to the, to the, the B2C models where they build a direct consumer relationship with their customers. And they do this for a number of reasons, one of which is to uh, hold, hold on to the margin that they're now giving up to other channel partners. Uh, secondly, is to uh, support uh, independent bookstore customers, because now publishers are, are working with the independent bookstores that the independent bookstore will take the, the uh, e-commerce order and the publisher will fulfill it, but make it appear as, as if it is a, uh, a, a, an independent uh, bookseller uh, transaction. And uh, I think that um, finally uh, publishers want to do this because it adds value to the enterprise. Uh, if a custom, if a publisher is thinking about putting a property up for sale, uh, they're a lot more valuable when they have these uh, tangible relationships with consumers. There's a lot of competition for shelf space in bricks and mortar. I think that there will be less visibility for books uh, particularly uh, at, uh, at, in some location as uh, other merchandise fills the shelf that we want to be with booksellers. So you want to make sure that your freight uh, mechanisms are in place to support all of the markets that you're dealing with, not only what's coming in, but also what's going out. And Susie, how about from the perspective of Meadows, why are you looking at freight in the U.S. as an issue? Absolutely. And I mean, we were really concerned um, during COVID with the major DCs not being able to get freight out, we were being asked, that's the onset of COVID, we've got all this freight coming in and people, the publisher to DCs are asking us, well, where can you put it? And now what I think that's become, what, what, I, what concerns me is I think we're approaching that again when I hear major distributors saying that FedEx and UPS are cutting their capacity by 25%. I, and I'm not going to name names, but there's one significant DC that we can't get freight into without um, quite a bit of demurrage and detention to their account because they can't get orders out. So that, that's, that's a worry. And Ryan, you, you, you talked a moment ago about the, the relatively limited uptake for new drivers uh, in, the, in the industry. So that's clearly a source of some of the strain. Are there other things that play here or is it just simply a, a shortage of capacity of qualified drivers? I would say the driver issue is, is one of the key, key components. And you know what we saw um, during, uh, I would say 2020, you know, with the COVID pandemic is, is you had a driver shortage that was already a challenge before U.S. freight demand surged. You know, the average age of a driver is 55 to 56. So you have a retiring baby boom generation and you don't have a new influx of drivers entering the market. You know, so that, that was issue number one. And then it got exponentially worse when uh, truck driving schools, you know, drivers looking to get their CDLs, you know, were operating at 40 to 50% capacity because of um, whether, you know, they were closed or social distancing requirements, you know, so it created, you know, the perfect storm with just, just moving freight, you know, so as, as we have um, several different sectors coming back online now, um, 
the trucking industry is trying to keep up. And, 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 and that is the number one challenge is recruiting qualified drivers, you know, that can drive legally in the U.S. And uh, one of the other things that I, I, I wanted to mention, you know, listening to Dave talk about the business model shift in, 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 the, in the move to e-commerce or the mode shift, as we call it, is if, if, if anybody is looking to do that, um, I would say it's very important to put those forecasts together in those freight volumes before you engage, you know, the duopoly, FedEx, UPS, or regional parcel carriers, you know, to make sure that, you know, you secure those commitments, um, you know, before, you know, moving a business model, because as, as, as we've seen, um, you know, FedEx and UPS, you know, put several customers uh, or, or customers on allocation last year. You know, which, you know, created not only a backlog of freight, um, you know, after the holidays, but also cost businesses a significant amount of sales. You know, so just, you know, looking at the overall growth of e-commerce volume, you know, that's one thing that, you know, I would be, you know, careful of with, with approaching the duopoly. Yeah, Matthew Baer, uh, who's my counterpart at the Book Manufacturers Institute, uh, just threw into the chat. For the panelists, uh, a note that the American Trucking Association estimates that there's a shortage of 60,000 truck drivers in the United States today. And it sounds like that's a number that you, everybody on this panel would not be surprised by. Um, Susie, at least some of what we're seeing involves ports both inside and outside the United States. And I know Matters Why tracks international shipping really around the world. Uh, what is it that your company is seeing? We're seeing port congestion at every major port. We're seeing um, trucker shortages all over the continent, just as pretty much David summarized, um, same in the UK. Uh, it's very difficult to, to get space now. We're, we're, we're buying on the spot market. The bigger carriers are gonna be wanting longer term contracts. Um, it's it's bad everywhere. So if you were manufacturing in China and you said, look, I don't have a piecework kids book so I can get high quality four color and go to Eastern Europe or which we've seen a lot of uh, migration to or to Italy, uh, Spain, it's just as bad out of there. Percentages, price rise, congestion, again, and then it hits wherever it's hitting, whether it's in the US or Europe, the, the detention and demurrage charges are insane. If somebody says to me, what is it gonna cost me next week to move a container from Hong Kong to New York? Well, I could probably pretty well project that what the actual freight cost is gonna be that close because there wouldn't be a general rate increase in a week with a week notice. But I can't tell you what your landing costs are going to be because it could be three weeks of storage of detention and demerit. There's and there's and be, it all goes back go back to what Ryan, what Ryan is saying and go backwards in the supply chain, and it's the same problem. There's a, a, the same thing with the rail. Our rail infrastructure isn't isn't. We don't have the infrastructure to support this 27% increase of imports. And there just simply aren't enough chassis. It's not just drivers or equipment shortages. So it's, it's, it's pretty bad everywhere. Um, it might be a good time to put up that slide showing where um, sure. on the Baltic freight index, where costs have gone out of China and East Asia to the US. You should be seeing it. I think I'm not seeing all of it. It needs to move up on my screen. There you go. So you can see okay. that, that where prices have gone. And uh, it's, it's really drastic from September 1st, 20 to today. So if I'm reading this correctly, before September of last year, the price was under $4,000 a container. Yes. Um, and currently it looks like it's uh, 
it's a little bit hard to see, but it looks like it's about seven thousand dollars. Yeah, um, but that's that's an average. It's really to get loaded, to get loaded to say Port of Baltimore right now. You're looking at eighteen thousand dollars. Pretty much same thing for Chicago, um, and like looking at the rate projections, it's going to hit close to twenty thousand. So it's it's again we're on the spot market. Um, it would be higher. Yeah, it it it. I mean, Ryan. We'll probably talk about that with truckers. That'd be interesting with your experience. Do you feel like you're just in a bidding war? Yes. One of my points uh, later on was we're, you know, usually within an over the road model here, talking about truckload freight, you have a mix of, of asset providers and, and brokerage providers. And, and obviously that, that could be 70, 30, 60, 40, um, you know, within your respective network. Um, but what we see or what we're seeing today is the fact is we're playing in the spot market daily to move our freight. You right. know, we are cycling through uh, first, second, third, fourth tiered carriers, you know, combinations of assets and brokers on specific lanes within our routing guides um, and, and loads are getting rejected, you know, uh, and, and it's the new norm right now. Um, you know, freight waves is still, you know, reporting that load rejections are, 22 to 25%, you know, for van freight, you know, which means that we are going to brokers and, and obviously, you know, taking the best bid that we can get to meet, you know, you know, on time delivery, MABD requirements for our customers. Um, you know, and, and we are, you know, given that challenge, we, we have explored some dedicated solutions, you know, for lanes that we're, we're, we're challenging. There are, there are a few things in that that are, maybe I could just tease out of you. So when you talk about asset, I mean, what would be an example of, of an asset, like a direct provider of contracted services? C correct, correct. You know, these are organ these are trucking or operating organizations that that own the trucks, you know, that, that finance the trucks, procure the trucks, you know, hire the drivers directly. You know, these are your, your major companies like Knight Transportation, you know, Swift, you know, LTL providers such as, uh, you know, FedEx Freight, you know, the companies that own the hard assets, you know, your broker obviously is your, you know, your person in the middle, you know, that has a relationship with independent owner operators, you know, or these co corporate owned asset organizations in order to uh, attempt to cast a wider net to offer shippers more capacity. Um, and, and that works during, you know, normal market situations, but, but, but when things are extremely tight, uh, you have every broker um, competing to, to grab that same independent owner operator, for example, to, you know, move a load out of Chicago to, you know, a target distribution center in, in Cedar Falls, Iowa. And those are the lanes that you refer to, like specific routes that are typically scheduled. Yep. And you, you talked about a rejection rate. What would lead to uh, uh, the rejection, for example, of a shipment? Is it, I don't have capacity, I got a higher rate from somebody else, uh, a mixture of the two? Yeah, so without getting too complex with over-the-road trucking models, uh, non-dedicated over-the-road models, um, you know, companies accept loads, you know, with adequate lead time tendering those loads to them. Um, believing that, you know, I have a driver out there in the network that's going to be offloading um, at a certain location, and we're going to be able to reposition that asset back to your DC. Okay. Um, if they, if, if that asset is not going to be back at the specific DC in time, that load is rejected, or a load is just flat out rejected because I don't have a fresh driver uh, with available hours to run that route this week. You know, those are just two examples. Thanks. That's really helpful. Um, it's, it sounds, and maybe I'll start with David on this, the, the second half of 2021 for freight and shipping looks much like what the situation is right now, that we have limited capacity and prices are going to remain high and may go higher. Is that a fair summary? I think it's a very reasonable summary, Brian. I also think that uh, there are no signs on the horizon that the, uh, the public uh, in America or elsewhere is going to, to uh, give up. Uh, on e-commerce, in fact, uh, perhaps more than anything, and that the pressure will increase the closer we get to the holidays. So I think that you know now is the time to, to really start that close examination and uh, 
you know, uh, if I make uh, sort of uh, modify a phrase from The Godfather, right? I would I would suggest that uh, you know you keep your friends close, but your carriers closer, yep. right? You uh, yep. you want to make sure that you have good working relationships with those folks. Now is not the time uh, to start uh, you know a debate about the price. Now I think the focus should be on availability and and cutting the length of the supply chain. Thanks. And Susie, from your perspective, is that are, are we likely to see a continuation of the current market uh, for the balance of the year? It'll go through, you know, on our side, you know, on the international side, it's going to continue certainly um, through the Chinese Lunar New Year 2022. And then the rates are never going to go back down. We, we don't believe to the levels that they were previously. The carriers, you know, have, have essentially gotten away with it because, you know, to, to continue to be able to raise the rate to this level. I mean, the steam carrier. So um, yeah, this, this, this is gonna continue. And as far as David said, this is really not a time to have any debate. I mean, it, that's like what we're trying to explain to our clients is we're outlaying huge amounts of money to pre-book guarantee space for them we're not particularly interested in new clients. We made a couple of exceptions if it didn't involve trucking because it's such, the trucking is such a problem. Um, and you know, the old um, system of RFP, uh, let's find the cheapest deal. I think that's over. I think we're going back to when air freight wasn't regulated and you just pick the best provider. So that would be my thoughts on that. And Ryan, we're starting, I mean, I imagine most uh, participants in the supply chain, publishers, distributors, retailers alike, are looking at uh, creating budgets for 2022 at this point. Um, you know, do you sort of see a continuation of this, as Susie said, through Lunar New Year next year, which would be late January, or early February? But, you know, is this something that publishers and, and other entities should be thinking about for all of 2022? Yes, I would uh, definitely build in, uh, you know, base rate, line haul, GRI, general rate increases into your freight rates, you know, for, for each respective mode, you know, making sure that you have um, very detailed conversations with, you know, a car the carrier hauling specific lanes uh, heading into 2022. Um, but let's also not forget fuel inflation and looking at the price of diesel you know, and making sure that, you know, you know, whatever the cost per gallon is, you know, at the time you start your budget, what does that translate to in regards to, you know, your organization's fuel surcharge table or fuel surcharge tables uh, that you follow with your carriers? Do you have any sense, uh, and this may be a bridge too far to ask you, but what, what publishers should be thinking about with respect to operations and lead times? I mean, uh, you work in a part of the business where lead times are already longer than most to deliver to the mass market. Um, you know, is it, is it something that publishers should be giving more leeway to, or is that, is that hard to see? I would say in times like this with when capacity is tight, it's basic blocking and tackling and when tendering loads, whether it's truckload or LTL, um, provide your loads, your load counts, you know, by origin to, uh, to, to, to your carriers anywhere from three to seven days in advance and working with those specific carriers to understand, you know, what is their sweet spot? You know, how soon do they want to see a load before they, they know they can accept it or they know they can commit, commit you know, drop trailers, you know, to move your freight um, and providing, um, you know, which we have done um, from an LTL standpoint, weekly volume forecasts in order to help them plan equipment, um, you know, which has helped us, you know, move loads, you know, in today's tough LTL market. So the more predictable one can be, whether a publisher, a distributor, yeah. um, or another part of the industry, the, the more likely it is that you'll be able to get the capacity you need. Yeah, and, and we all understand that forecasts are forecasts. They're never accurate. They're never 100% accurate, but, but anything that you can provide to a carrier ahead of time, um, they do appreciate it, and, and it will increase your chances for success. Thanks. I have a, for the audience, I have a couple of other questions I just want to ask quickly. Um, if you have, we have a couple of questions already in the queue, but uh, if you have questions that you want to ask, 
Uh, best place to put them is in the Q&A um, window that's on the bottom of your screen. Uh, I think we also have a couple of things that have come in in chat and I'll follow those, but better in the Q&A box. It's easier to track. Um, so question really, uh, I think this starts with David, you recommended engagement with organizations like BISG. Um, what can BISG be doing here? I mean, are there steps that we should be taking that can help the industry? Uh, I use those examples, information sharing, a best practice guide, recruitment efforts, is there something else? I think actually, you know, uh, there's some information that uh, we worked on last year that might be useful to share with people, and that was the supply chain mapping that right. we did. You know, I think that uh, what uh, we'd like to be able to, to uh, have our colleagues in the industry do is to take advantage of the work that's been done and rather than reinvent it. And, you know, obviously, you, you may want to uh, uh, validate what we did for BISG against your own supply chain, but I think there's likely to be a lot of common ground and the faster that you get that view of this, the better. The other thing I would suggest is that, you know, actively participating in these uh, conversations that we have on a monthly basis, uh, you know, there, there's no shortage of good ideas on these calls. And, and I mean, frankly, uh, this is not the time to stand on pride of ownership, you know, not invented here. So you have people like Susie, you have uh, folks like Ryan uh, and other folks on the call who I think you know, can give you ideas that may provide solutions to some of the challenges that you're dealing with. So uh, you know, uh, uh, everyone is welcome. Uh, Ryan, from your perspective, anything that, that we as an organization could either be doing or helping uh, promote? I would say just in general, going back to um, one of my earlier points, just it, it's education across the whole end-to-end -end supply chain. Um, and, and before I was in the book industry here, I mean, it's, it's, it's a continual educational process to make sure that you're providing the necessary support to your sales teams and data, you know, that way they can have, you know, meaningful conversations, you know, with customers when needed you know, when it comes to, you know, servicing particular areas of, of the business within the portfolio. Great. Thank you. You know, that way, that way, you know, the expectations are, are, are clear. And Susie, do you see a role for us uh, in some of the issues that you're grappling with? Is there something that BISC can do to improve awareness or um, lobby for a specific outcome? Absolutely. I think people need to, I think, I think this, this within itself, this webinar, I think that there has to be a real reality check to the fact that the truckers, the carriers are setting prices that are extraordinarily high. They're demanding to get that space. We're gonna, we have to pay it upfront to get it. And people, that, so what I guess what I'm saying is credit turns have shrunk to almost nothing. Okay, so we're in a different, we're in a different environment now. You know, there were print brokers that made make money, used to make money off of a freight. I mean, that would be, and give 90 day term. That's not gonna happen anymore. I mean, we're, it, it, it's, it, everybody has to recognize that if you're, if you're sourcing from, you know, internet, the international portion specifically, but also the additional trucking, you have to be prepared to pay that bill. And, and it, it's, it, it, it's, it's, that's the most important message I think that could be passed. The other thing I think the BSG could do if you have the resources, I saw the chat from Paul Markowski at Bayard. I was asking about, is there, is there any government intervention going to come into play here? And there was some noise in Europe that the governments were gonna get involved in, in, in stopping the carriers from you know, this extortionary price pricing, specifically the ocean carriers, you know, if you guys have the resources, I haven't seen anything where any government's getting involved to fix it. I just, all I've seen is, you know, it going, getting exacerbated by the not being able to get goods by ocean, now going by air and pushing those prices way up. So just getting worse. Yeah, Paul, Mark Carsu's question uh, for Ryan and David, if you're not seeing it, it's just wondering if there are any uh, government lobby groups or subcommittees looking into this. Typically, the BISG does not do lobbying. We're organized as a C6, but without a lobbying component. But AAP, the Association 
American publishers might be a, a resource. Yeah, you know, so there's been there's been quite a few discussions. Um, it, I guess, at the DC level about lowering the the, the driving age, you know, from 21 to 18. Um, but we haven't seen anything yet, you know, with 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 trying to drive, you know, an influx of, you know, younger drivers into the industry to to, to offset the uh, the supply and demand imbalance here. Um, right. If anything, we are probably looking at more regulations placed on the trucking industry with insurance requirements that are only going to drive rates higher within the next couple of years. And that's been going on for, for, for quite a few years here. And we're probably some years off from uh, driverless trucking, I imagine. Yeah. Right, you know, one, one point I think uh, I neglected to mention before, but I'd like to bring it up now is that I think that the smaller your organization, the more important it is that you, you pay attention to this. You know, because uh, the, the the big five have the, the the volume and the resources to manage the process. The smaller organizations do not. So I think that you you want to take advantage of the uh, expertise that uh, the BISG and and the, the members of the committee can offer here. Uh, I've never seen anybody hesitate to share a good idea, you know, uh, because of the concern about uh, shifting a competitive advantage. Thanks. Actually, David, on, on that point, you know, just for the smaller companies that don't have volume to leverage in the marketplace, um, one of the things that I have seen to be successful is um, the, 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 what do we want to call it? The, the 4PL enterprise logistics model. Um, with gauging, engaging with you know, companies that provide transportation services that can go to the trucking industry with not just your volume, um, but other shippers volume in order to you know, bundle it together you know, to get the best optimal rates and, and cast the widest net when it comes to engaging as many carriers as possible, you know, regardless of the mode in order to find capacity. You know, so just, just one thought here, because I have worked for smaller shippers and, and it's difficult. Thank you, good idea. I have a, a, one other question, but I'd like to hold it because we have several in the queue from the audience and love to be able to get them for you. Uh, so Simon made the observation, I think responding to David's comments earlier that the more issues there are with freight, the more publishers are, uh, might potentially consider zero inventory or on demand and short run printing close to the market. And is that something you'd agree with? You're, you're muted, David. Yeah, absolutely. I think uh, what we found is that, uh, you know, we have customers uh, in the U.S. Uh, who have needs for inventory uh, in the U.K. and on the continent, and that they are now manufacturing, you know, effectively, uh, you know, in-country rather than taking the, the risk and the additional cost of importation. And we have the same thing in reverse coming into the United States. Uh, not too long ago, I remember having a conversation with someone uh, from a, uh, a continental uh, a book publisher who said that, you know, we need our books manufactured to European standards, not American standards. Well, that's great. You know, if you wanna wait four months for the books to reach the United States, but if you've got an adoption sale pending, right? Uh, you know, you're a lot better off manufacturing the book in the United States and getting it out and closing the sale. I so imagine I think, that I imagine that would also be true of mass market, which has really strict uh, uh, cutoffs for uh, getting into stores. Yeah, yeah, I think uh, I, I do think, however, you know, with that with mass market product, you have an equipment challenge. You know, as much as I am an advocate of digital, it does have its limitations, and I think ab above five thousand units, you probably want to think twice, at least from an economic standpoint. But from an availability standpoint, you know, uh, it's it's a proven solution uh, that I think uh, people really want to take uh, as much advantage of as, as they can right now. And I think Simon also asks, I, I think you started to allude to this uh, in your, your remarks. Are you seeing publishers look into total landed costs, and not just looking at the unit manufacturing costs? Yeah, uh, it, it really is a, a, a TCO, right? Total cost of ownership. Uh, consideration that you have to have. You can't focus on, on unit manufacturing costs. You have to look at, at the total cost of having it, the cost of not having it, 
and uh, you know the the uh, implications of having you know a large uh, just in case inventory. I think while there are challenges on the offset front for capacity, I think that there are fewer challenges on the digital front for capacity. So if you're in the short run business under four under five thousand copies. And I think for the most part, you know, with the exception of coffee table books or books that have a, uh, you know, some sort of a special uh, device or toy in them, there's not too much now that digital can't handle. So I, I would commend you to uh, our, our listeners, you know, to really give this a close look. Thanks. Um, for Ryan and Susie, uh, Courtney's asking, um, how do you evaluate USPS capacity going forward, maybe in relation to the debt duopoly that you referred to, Ryan, UPS and FedEx? I mean, is that an adequate resource or is it uh, um, really a special need, case? Yeah, I think you need to, to look at your, uh, your shipping portfolio and look at your various weight, weight breaks to determine, you know, what, what piece of that can you break out um, and then provide to the uh, UPS, United States Postal Service for, for quoting. Um, it's not a one for one, obviously, just given the weight of, of product, you know, that UPS can move, you know, versus the Postal Service, you know, last mile delivery. You know, Brian, uh, volume weight breaks. Brian, do you have any observations you can share about uh, media mail? Just, to, you know, anecdotally, I will tell you that, you know, we have customers at Books International who ask us to ship by uh, media mail. And I think, uh, you know, our experience has been that they probably get a faster delivery to the customer if they sent it by, uh, by uh, sale than they would uh, through, through media mail. The delivery times have been extended. And uh, I think if, if time is of the essence, is that a vehicle that people should be considering? I'm not familiar with media mail. Um, yeah. Definitely, you know, worth worth exploring if it, you know, shortens the lead time and gets the product to the customer. Well, actually, it does just the opposite. It, it saves money, but unfortunately, oh, longer, longer delivery, right? Long, considerably okay. longer lead time. So, so I was curious if you had an experience with it. Uh, no, I don't. Yeah, and on, on unrelated to this discussion, we've been doing a number of things in terms of sharing resources and coverage of the current state of the postal service in the United States and. Uh, uh, it's become a little bit of a political football, but a lot of the coverage of operations suggests that they, there are ways from being a stable uh, alternative for um, particularly relative to, you know, uh, the U UPS and FedEx. Yeah. And, and I would also look at DHL, you know, DHL is in business and they are moving freight, um, you know, domestically and internationally. And, you know, DHL does engage with, uh, the United States Postal Service as their last mile provider, you know, so that is, you know, an opportunity. Um, but I would also explore regional parcel carriers. I mean, there's, there's hundreds out there um, in, 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 in finding a regional parcel carrier that, you know, is strong, you know, locally or regionally, you know, can also help, you know, reposition freight away from, you know, FedEx and UPS, you know, yes, you're going to pay more. Um, but, but it's about getting product to the customer on time, the right place. And then uh, the last couple of questions we have from those attending, both from uh, George. Uh, one, probably the more adventurous one, I'll start with you, Ryan, on this. Uh, could the government import driver trainees from South America, like farm workers offering incentives like citizenship? It's been discussed, yes. <laughs> you know, we. Uh, I think that, I mean, it's, when you look at the trucking industry, you know, you know, immigration is extremely important with, with bringing qualified workers in, you know, that, that want to drive a truck, you know, so, um, you know, that is discussed in conjunction with, you know, lowering the driving age, you know, how do we, you know, not only, you know, make, make the barriers of entry, you know, easier, you know, but how, to, how does the industry in general, you know, with support of the government market to all different types of, you know, groups of people, you know, to, to try to recruit people to, you know, come drive a truck. So. Um, I've never driven a truck, but my sense of the, the, the livelihood is that it's a tough way to make a living. So it, and it's got to be, an, that's got to be part of it as well. People yeah. um, probably are choosing other career paths. Uh, and the last question I had is uh, for, for, the, for all three of you, 
are there anything uh, essentially mitigation efforts for this this import and, and freight crisis um, that publishers will lean to? Do you think you're going to see lower print runs, uh, uh, more audio and EPUB uh, sales, et cetera, in 20 for the next year, year and a half? Ryan, I want to go back to something David said. We, I'm going to spin off your saying mitigate. Um, I know that David's concerned that everybody focuses on the bigger publishers, or there's a lot of focus on the bigger publishers. And David, you expressed concern that there be um, help for the smaller folks. And um, one thing that Meadows Y has done over the years, we never said no to the little guys going back that now became big guys. Um, as far as mitigating, if we were in a normal environment, I'd be very um, adamant to say we are going we could save you money as a little guy on your imports by consolidating and we target every dc so what we do is we prorate our containers we don't we don't take a little guy and abuse them we put them in with other freight and then we prorate it um, and so that's something maybe we could even in this horrible situation we could do to help some of the smaller bisg uh, members who also may be relying on printers who are now going to be potentially charging very high uh, rates for them to go CIF, whereas we'll protect somebody from the additional landing charges. So if you've got a couple cubic meters, as far as helping the small guys and mitigating some of this pain, I guess that's something we could do. David or Ryan, your thoughts? I mean, are there things that you think are likely go-to strategies in the next uh, year, year and a half? I would say uh, Susie brought up traditional RFPs. I mean, I, I think the days of just, hey, we got to reduce our transportation costs by 20% <laughs> because, because that's what we've always done every other 18 months, you know, with the normal trucking cycles. We're not seeing that anymore. We're, we're not seeing that normal trucking cycle anymore. I would say when it comes to RFP, um, I think we need to understand, you know, what I think the DAT or a trucking association, you know, blog writers have, have coined the phrase as the mini bid, you know, understanding what specific lanes are we seeing uh, excessive costs coupled with service issues and how do we surgically engage the right carriers and secure capacity for service, um, you know, and in balance cost and service. We have just a, a couple of minutes left and I, I wanna be respectful of your time as well as our audience. So maybe I'd ask each of you, um, starting with you, Ryan, for final thoughts, uh, anything that you want, you know, the one thing that you want people to take away from today's conversation. I would say one of the things that I always talk about all the time, and I know Dave brought this up several times, is we've relied on inventory and transit way too long with JIT. And, and I like the phrase, Dave, you, you use just in case. Um, and we understand the implications of holding more inventory and the costs involved, um, you know, and, and, and it can be time sensitive. But if you can buffer inventory and pool inventory, um, it, it's going to help you, you know, ser service orders and, and, and fulfill orders quicker rather than always relying on a carrier with that inventory to, to hope, hope you get it in time and, you know, cross stock and throughput it, you know, anything you can do to hold inventory, um, you know, can help relieve some of that pressure off of the transportation network right now. Uh, Susie, how about from here? What, what's the takeaway that you'd like to make sure that everybody has in mind? Be realistic before you start planning your manufacturing in China and in Europe and know you're, you're probably going to have to double your lead times and be clear you're not going to be able to have any cost guarantees and be prepared. Great, thanks. That's really helpful. And David, how about from your perspective? I think uh, what I would uh, ask everyone to remember is that it is a different ball game now and that uh, the old rules, uh, most, many of them do not apply any longer. Uh, I would uh, you know, think about what go, could go wrong before it goes wrong and you know, plan for those contingencies. 
Uh, Susie, David, and Ryan, thank you for making the time today and for preparing uh, for this session. And I, I really appreciate that this is a part of the industry that we have not spent as much time on as some others. And uh, I think it's uh, both important and clearly given the messages that you have, critically important for the industry to understand what's happening in both imports and, and freight in the United States. Uh, we'll, we'll figure out a way to do uh, some more work on this in the second half of 2021. But it's also the case that we'll have a recording of this for the for anyone who wants it uh, available probably uh, at the end of this week. So anyone who's anyone who's registered already, everybody who's on the call right now will receive that. But we'll make sure that uh, the message gets out wide and clear. Thank you again, and uh, take care. All the best for a good afternoon. Thank, Thank you. you, everyone. Bye -bye. All right. Thanks for having me.